my parents met on a ship. Not your typical ship, but this one, the Cap Anamur. This picture has been hanging in our living rooms since my sister and I can even think of. Because the crew of this ship saved my parents from drowning. You see, my parents are both people, refugees fleeing their home country of Vietnam in order to have a better life. After the Vietnam War, it was estimated that more than a million people fled this country because of danger, because of economic insecurities, because of a crisis. This journey is dangerous, and they faced pirates, deadly diseases, and merciless storms. It's so dangerous, every third person who tried it drowned. Governments, leaders, promised to act in this humanitarian crisis, promised to send, but didn't deliver. Instead, a group of friends in Germany watching this crisis unfold on television decided it's enough. It's enough to wait. We have to take our time and take our own money to charter this ship and go to Vietnam and save my parents and 10,000 other people from drowning. It is because of them, their initial courage, their unwillingness to wait for leaders and governments to act and act themselves while it's the most urgent, that I'm standing here today breathing and alive at TEDx with a slight German accent. <laughs> today, we're here because we're in the middle of the largest crisis humanity has ever faced, the ecological and climate emergency. This is not about extreme weather. This is about people. The United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees estimated that since 2010, more than 21 million people have been dislocated because of the climate crisis. That is more than refugees caused by all the wars together in this period. And in the next 30 years, these numbers are going to explode. It is estimated that more than a billion people are going to be affected by the climate crisis, potentially have to leave the place they call home. These are people from the global south, local communities, indigenous people that have been living there at the front lines and have contributed the least but suffered the most. We are here to talk about the climate crisis, not about as an extreme weather event, but as the largest potential humanitarian disaster that is facing us today. I believe it doesn't have to be like this. You see, I'm an artificial intelligence researcher. It's a little bit weird to come here and stand here and talk about climate change, but let me give you a little bit of the background. Four years ago, I left my job at Silicon Valley to start a PhD here at ETH Zurich, very close by, and had the honor to attend a hackathon at the United Nations COP23 in Bonn. There we talked about how technology could potentially be used to tackle that crisis. And I learned about forests and the importance of forests for our climate. You see, the forests I grew up in, the black forests in Germany, or the rainforests my parents grew up in in Vietnam, they all have one thing in common. If you handle it right, if you treat it right, if you protect it properly, if you preserve it, forests can capture up to one third of the emissions. But if you treat it wrong, you can turn a tree from a carbon sink into a carbon bomb. You see, if you burn a tree, all the carbon that has been locked for centuries in this tree is getting released back to the atmosphere. Deforestation and land use change account for 18% of global emissions. Of course, our leaders, governments, and the United Nations know about this. So we came up with results-based payments. So this is just a fancy word for if you protect a landowner, if a landowner protects an area of forest and that tree is happy and captures a lot of carbon, the more this person should get paid because he helps to mitigate climate change. So that's wonderful because we need to protect and conserve nature in order to have a chance 
against this crisis, right? And it's also wonderful because if landowners can earn an income for doing something good and sustainable, they don't have to flee, they don't have to leave their homes. They can stay and turn agriculture into protected ecotourism. That's just one catch. It sounds great on paper, but it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because of one thing only. Trust. You see, when you apply for these payments, landowners have to report, self-report their progress on how much they preserved, how much they protected. And governments and leaders are like, wait a minute, let me double check. And the double checking, triple checking, that costs time, up to 10 years. So would you work on something where you think your paycheck is coming only in 10 years later? I mean, that's not really trustworthy on either sides. What if technology, and that's the idea here, can provide us with trust-enhancing mechanisms that can help us unleash these funds, these large financial funds that have been promised to these communities? So during the hackathon, my team and I came up with GainForest. GainForest is a green fund that leverages artificial intelligence and blockchain technology to reward sustainable nature stewardship. It works like this. We use artificial intelligence and satellite imagery to look at the land area someone's protecting and look at the land area someone is not protecting and compare the differences and see if there is some additionality, some benefit. No more hiding, no more self-reporting, no more systematic overcounting. That's what this model delivers. On the other hand, we use blockchain-based technology to mathematically prove that your payment, if you protect something, comes and arrives to you not in decades, but in seconds. And at the same time, we can connect people that are usually not connected through the traditional finance system. And lastly, donors can trace their donation because it is clear exactly who unleashed what. So with this idea, we won the COP23 hackathon and were able to present in front of the delegates. And that was wonderful for a couple of students. And we thought, okay, let's go back our ways. And I would never have thought what would have come next. The Kayapo people in the Amazon protects an area twice the size of the UK in continuous forests. That is a biodiversity paradise. You know, just the, the river, the single river alone that flows through that area has 1,500 different fish species. Indigenous people make up only 5% of the world population, but protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And more so, the carbons estimated to be stored in that forest area is 9 billion tons. That is more than the annual emission of the United States. So, four years ago, an NGO that works closely with the CAPO contacted us and asked us if we can help raise funds for the CAPO because they have trouble raising funds. I was like, but Gainfall is not real. And they told me, but can you make it real? Because what the Kayapo is facing right now here is the following thing. They are protecting us from a climate disaster. They are protecting this area. There are just 10,000 people protecting this area with a couple dozen guard posts. And they have trouble raising the minimum amount of funds to protect this area. Why? If we pledge so much money to forest protection. You know, I always believed our leaders and governments when they said, there's no money for climate protection. There is no money for nature conservation. I could not be more wrong. It is not about money. It's about missing ethics and missing values. Because in the last 18 months, more than $17,000 billion have been spent on COVID recovery. That is money largely borrowed by us future generations. So our governments are leaving us not just financially broke, 
but potentially with a broken planet. After learning this, I couldn't go back to business as usual. I had to do something. Because Gainforce's vision has always been to be that passive income that has been promised by the governments, by the leaders to these communities, but has not been delivered. So I was fortunate enough to meet on my way the last four years like-minded people who became my friends, who shared that vision to make Gainforest not just a hackathon project, but a reality. But designing incentives is really hard. You know, the Kayapo people have a word for money. You know our dollar bill? They call it Pio Caprim, a sad leaf. Because it's that, it's sad, and the moment it touches their communities, historically it only brought destruction and death. It corrupted their people, it incentivized land alienation. Bad incentives. So when we were trying to design our systems with them, I, we thought as a team that we are helping them, supporting them. But never would I have imagined how much we learned from them. And these are the lessons I want to share with you. You know, when we first initialized the idea of paying them according to how much forest they protect, we wanted to pay them on an individual basis, like per village, per person. The more a person protects, the more a village protects, the more he should receive, right? Wrong. You know, when I first presented that to them, they were looking at me and like, David, 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 you Westerners, in our culture, in our tradition, we share everything. We don't compete. So they showed us to introduce, instead of individualistic payments, group-based payments, where we pay out the capital as a whole. And that actually, on the other hand, incentivize more accountability, more tractability, and trust instead of driving competition. The second lesson they taught us is about the ethics of technology. So when we started using blockchain-based technology, we wanted to connect them to a world they are usually marginalized from, the financial system. But they made us question about the energy efficiency of our solution. And they are absolutely right. Ever since then, we realize our solutions are not perfect, and we are abandoning everything which has not been sustainable in a certain sense. It's still a far way to go, but we think by being aware of this and making sure that we are here on the same page, net benefits us more than without thinking about this. And lastly, they made us question the data itself, the artificial intelligence that has been running in our models. Because you see, as an artificial intelligence researcher, when you train an AI model on a data set, it will perform really good on this data set, but really bad on something it has not seen before. So where do we have all the data collected? Well, the countries who have the infrastructure to collect that data, right? Europe, North America. So our models perform really good on North American forests, but it perform kind of shady on other places because of missing data lags. So instead, we trusted them and introduced participatory mapping systems where they can input their own knowledge in. And also, we investigated and started to re release benchmarks where we understand and investigate if existing models that are now being sold to the United Nations on forest monitoring are biased. We think that these lessons learned made our overall system not just better, but necessary and actually now implementable. And we hope that by learning from them and having this as a lesson of co design technology, not just for them, but together with indigenous, with local communities' knowledge, we can actually create impact and solutions that are usable for everyone. When our leaders and governments are giving us empty promises and marginalizing or even ignoring the perspective of the global south, and these communities. It is our duty as a society, as people, to stand up, to have the courage to drive the progress, to charter the ships and support them 
end their fight at the front line of the climate crisis because they are our superheroes. And Gainforce is my team's ship, and every one of you have a ship. Maybe art, maybe science, maybe activism, maybe diplomacy. So let's stop talking, let's act now, let's set sail.